Okay, we're started. Okay. Um, welcome to the Board of Health meeting of December 14th, 2023. Uh, the preamble is uh, I'll be that it's pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and renewed by Governor Maura Healy. This meeting of the Board of Health will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so by following the instruction on the Board of Health posted agenda via Zoom. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings as soon as it is technologically possible. After this meeting, all approved Board of Health minutes are posted on our website once they are approved by the board. I will now open the December 14th, 2023 Board of Health meeting at 5.30 with a roll call. Um, Tim? Here. Premila? Here. Lauren? Here. Maureen? Here. And Risha, we know, is absent. Okay. Um, for the first item, we need to review the minutes of November 9th, 2023. Um, I wondered if anyone had any corrections or um, concerns about that. No? Lauren, no? I wasn't here, so I guess I can't vote on the minute. Oh, so. Yeah, but there still are three of us who were there and are here. So um, can I have a motion to accept the meeting minutes from December, November 9th, 2023? Yeah, I, I can make a motion to accept the minutes of November 9th, 2023. And I'll second. Okay, and we'll uh, have a vote. Uh, Premla? Yes. He, he just Tim. Aye. Maureen. Aye. So the minutes are accepted. Um, the next section is for public comment on items uh, related to the current uh, agenda. Are there any? Members of the public present. I don't see any. If, if there are okay. So no members of the public. Um so I guess we can move right along to the old business. And the first item being the body art regulations, and hopefully the final review and vote. Um I um let's see. I know I I had some thoughts that I sent out previously for people to consider and and I know that um Kyle had done some research you know to help us review the 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 concerns that were brought up by but mostly by Stephen um Lambert um so let me, I was just gonna get my copy of the actual document up here. As I was telling uh, Kiko, I, I, had to, I had a plan for this <laughs> and I have two, two, I have a computer and an iPad and at the last minute I had to switch their roles because I couldn't get onto Zoom with my new computer and I can with my iPad, so. Bear with me if uh, there's any if there's some delays in this process. I'm not sure how we want to go through this. I know um, in that document from Kyle, um, it brought up several issues, and I thought maybe we could proceed through them one by one and see if anyone has comments there or if there are comments about any other area 
if you would like to hear that too. Um, if not, um, I can just start by rolling through those sections. Maureen, just to confirm, um, the red, the, the red uh, in the latest version of the regulation represents the changes now? Yes, yeah. yes. <clears throat> and I don't have that right, that whole school. That's not what I'm, I'm looking at the wrong thing here right now. So let me get to the right thing. Uh, I'm sorry. somehow I'm not, I got myself out of word even so that's not that's not a good sign hold on a sec Let us know if it would be helpful to resend you the document so it's at the top of your email, if that's helpful at all. That would probably be a good idea because there's so many things labeled Bobby body art without a lot of uh, uh, that it's going to be hard for me to get to the right one. What about oh, just maybe this is Todd's it. email? I've, uh, no, that's not it. Todd's email? Todd's email, yeah. Because he yeah, that would yeah. I, I just resent you Kyle's email, so it should be at the top of your inbox okay. if that if that okay. helps. Not quite here yet, but oh, it dear. will be. Yes. Uh, I think Maureen, will it help me, you know, go go in my document? Just the red highlighted ones? Yeah, that would be it. okay. You want me to do that? Sure, yes. Okay. Sorry, All right. I, I'm kind of distracted. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are on the body art regulation 12.3 post hearing edits, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll just go through some of the red highlighted ones okay. or red font. So in the right. second page, we have a definition of ASTM. Uh, mm -hmm. which is the American Society for Testing and Materials. So which which uh, I believe uh, it states some of the international standards on uh, uh, materials, products and systems and services. You know, so. Mm -hmm. so that's a very straightforward one, I think, right? Right. I added that because that's the organization that um, approved that the CDC and the FDA uses to as, uh, evaluate gloves, and that's where that came from. Okay. So that's good. Third page, uh, I think there was one qualifier added for communicable disease or conditions mm -hmm. uh, where it is diagnosed by a licensed healthcare provider. So that was added, you know. Yeah, that was uh, to replace physician, to reflect the current medical practice. Okay, on page five, uh, there's a definition for gloves. Uh, shall mean medical grade, single use disposable gloves that meet the ASTM standards. So that's yeah. straightforward definition. Right, and that seems fine. Yeah. To, yeah, these those are straightforward, those parts. Yeah. So uh, on page 11, on the top of the page, um, uh, we, we have like a section G. Mm -hmm. This is for restrictions and prohibitions. Mm -hmm. The use of a piercing gun 
parts of which can come into contact with the client's skin or bodily fluids is not allowed. So that was added. That was, right. And I think body artists don't tend to use those, but I thought we would just put that in there anyway. Okay. There's another section. Maybe we'll be on page eight, section B. Um, that it, we didn't change, but it, it says, I think it allows, it says that these regulations don't apply to piercing of the ear only with uh, what sounds like a piercing gun, but isn't really a piercing gun. It's something that's a one, has a one-time use cartridge and is safer than piercing guns. And that was the language that was previously there. And it, I think it was confusing because it sounds like a piercing gun, but it's actually, it has that issue of the single use cartridge. So that's a different thing. So I, I just wanted to point that out in case anybody had questions about that. That was in section five. But I um, think B, section I think. eight, page right. eight, section, it, it's section B piercing. Um, yeah. Right, under exclusions, exemptions. exemptions. Then there was another part that didn't get changed. So I'm just gonna go through this that on page nine, all those restrictions of the various procedures I think Stephen advocated for expanding those to body artists. My feeling was that this was similar to the local, um, the same as the local uh, regulations and would remain legal only if it's done by a healthcare provider or physician. I don't know if anyone else had strong feelings about changing that. doesn't sound like it. <laughs> okay, so then I'll now now on to the red on to the red uh, changes that you can follow. Okay. I think so I, on page already, 11 too. 11, yeah. And then page same page 11 uh, there is a under physical plant um, there was added in a divider partition or a curtain. So a curtain was added. I think that I went through, um, I was trying to find this idea of an open floor plan and I couldn't find that anywhere, but I did find, and I think it was Easton Mass that they had the option for a curtain. And I thought adding that option would provide the ability to have a more of an open floor plan and more flexible kind of uh, facility. So that seemed like a reasonable consideration. Um, and I think I, I, I think I understand this idea. It's like, if you're gonna be cleaning floors and things, partitions and whatever, get in the way, but this is something movable and washable and uh, it, it, you know, maybe not as attractive <laughs> as some things. It reminds you of the hospital emergency room, but, um, but, it's a thought, um, and if they're pulled back nicely, I'm sure it will look okay. Um, and the next section, this we might get a little more discussion about. Um, I'll let you go ahead, though, Tim. I'm not sure I've got the right wording here. Oh, um, I'm just following the red fonts, you know, so. Right, right. Um, so the next uh, red font or highlighted one is edit, with edits is page number 15. So yeah. this is about the uh, hepatitis, hepatitis B, I think. So we added a statement, I believe it's from Northampton. Mm -hmm. Any practitioner uh, providing body art services while diagnosed with or suspected of ha having an acquired immun immunodeficiency condition or hepatitis B shall observe and follow all conditions C 
or all current CDC standards. So, and there is a reference to MMWR 91 right. document. Right. Um, and that document is updated periodically. It's, a con it's hard to cite those documents, the MMWR, but um, the idea being that mo for the most part, it's just universal precautions. If, if a person has a particular uh, variant of hepatitis B where you, they can be much more contagious and then thoughts about what high, if they're particularly high risk procedures, they should just be considering that for the, I don't even think there are any of the very high risk procedures that are done with, certainly not tattooing and probably not with piercing either. I think it comes into play with certain types of surgical procedures, but there just should be a certain awareness of, of, of those high risk, higher, even higher, higher risk issues. And again, that I stole from Northampton. Um, And so any questions or, or thoughts about that from anyone else? No. All right, Jim, <laughs> onward. Can I, ask, can I ask a question? So we're, we're talking about three, right? A D3 right now, is that correct? Yep. Okay. Yep. So then in, it's when it says acquired immuno and acquired immunodeficiency condition, that's broader than just HIV? You know, I think that might be an old term. You know, it might just, just whether we should modernize that to say HIV, but I, I. Yeah. I mean, my feeling is that it's not, if we're talking about HIV, and so my question is, is there something HIV. else besides HIV that's an acquired autoimmune deficiency, uh, excuse me, acquired immunodeficiency condition, in which case I can understand that's broader language. But if we're referring to HIV, we should call it HIV disease. Okay. That's my, my sense, right? Others in the field, isn't that the correct nomenclature these days? I, I think that's very reasonable. Um, like I said, I was quoting, but I think to uh, update that language would probably make sense. Okay. So let me just write that down. Pramila, do you agree? I mean, you're a, you're a practitioner, right? Okay. <laughs> Uh, Hello, Lauren, can you hear me? Yep, go ahead, Lauren, we can hear you. From the last meeting, I thought it was brought up that um, disclosing certain conditions like HIV, we didn't want to really do that. So would this touch on that or no? Okay. I don't think this requires disclosing anything. It just requires the practitioner to be cognizant of, of any unusual risks or any risks um, that, that they might have. Um, but it doesn't require them to disclose that to us or to clients or um, to employers either. Um, so that's, that's not, not a disclosure issue. It's just taking responsibility um, for being safe. Um, okay. There's another section where I, I don't think we changed anything, but um, on page 17, section H about hepatitis B vaccination for the practitioner. Um, I might have added something somewhere about adding apprentice to, to just to, to include them in the discussion, but yeah, again, that's what you added, and apprentices. Yeah. I, a lot of your practitioners and apprentices. Again, I don't think that requires people to um, disclose any illness or anything. If it discloses a decision whether or not to be vaccinated. And it's, um, and it's really a protection for employees that the, that the employer should um, offer that, that uh, opportunity to be vaccinated for, to, for hepatitis B to protect themselves 
as they do the work that they do. Um, it's really pretty common in a lot of settings, even from the you know custodians and like the colleges and anyone who who might somehow be exposed to hepatitis B. It's uh, it's their it's they they need to to know about it and to have the opportunity and to make a decision. So it's not, again, sort of disclosing any medical information in particular. So how I see that anyway, I don't know if people see that differently. Again, I'm immersed in this and um, sometimes don't see how other people might uh, see things differently. So it states like a hepatitis B vaccination status. So that has to be disclosed, right? How right, would we know? I, right. So we I think. Say, uh, it's like, it's like for going to kindergarten or something. I don't know. <laughs> you have to have your vaccines, but you don't even have to have this vaccine. You just have to say you received the information and, and yeah. have it or declined it. Um, I, I guess. So wh why don't we move this one, the hepatitis B vaccinations information and any type of a notification to the section number one, which is a establishment information. You know. So what where we can say the establishment should provide all the information about hepatitis B to the employers or something. I think it says that at some point in a different section. Okay. I, and again, I don't have it all, the whole thing in front of me, which is frustrating to me right now. Um, yeah, it does say that on page 16, under establishment record keeping, there's um, employee information, which shall include blah, 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 hepatitis B vaccination status or declination notification. Right. Is that yeah. what we're already talking about? Okay. And yeah, that's a, that's a, that's the section we are talking about in the okay. sense, how would we know the status? So that has to be disclosed um, in so terms just, of vaccination. Yeah, yeah. To, to the, um, yeah, it does. It is, it is disclosing medical information that's i don't feel like it's the most sensitive type of medical information and, but it is um asking to know that uh if i'm following you correctly you're saying that um practitioners would voluntarily have to disclose certain medical information such as the hepatitis b or autoimmune or immunodeficiency? No, no, just hepatitis B, whether they had the vaccine or declined the vaccine. Oh, okay. Yeah. Th that, that, that's the level of the information. And they could decline it because they already have hepatitis B and they don't you know, the vaccine isn't going to do them any good, but we don't need to know why they declined the vaccine. We just want to know that they had the opportunity to get the vaccine and right. decide or no. But it's still a voluntary disclosure. What? The disclosure isn't voluntary. The vaccine is voluntary. They don't have to have the vaccine. Okay. So, uh, uh -huh. yeah. I think there is something about that elsewhere too, but I think it doesn't say anything different than that does. Um, So can we make it uh, uh, after, you know, vaccination status 
And immediately following that, can we make it some sort of optional or voluntary? Not After that, just just to not make it, it's a mandatory, you know, to disclose. So I'm just saying, you know, hepatitis B vaccination status, and in parentheses, we should have some condition, you know, so it's optional information or something, or declination notification. I guess I don't see why we would have that. Um, I feel like that negates the whole statement in a way because that allows um, employers not to provide that uh, option to get the vaccination. And, you know, if we don't know it, it, it you know, I, I feel like probably the health department can help people get vaccinated if they need to be vaccinated. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of expensive. It's an expensive vaccine, if I remember. Uh, Premala probably knows <laughs> um, how much it is these days, but, um, you know, it's required. It's required for going to in the co for college and and yeah, it's yeah. hard not to look at this as a healthcare provider because yeah. it is so basic in 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 every sort of setting and yeah. all we're asking is whether the vac vaccination whether they've completed the vaccine series right yeah. um. Yeah, now infants are vaccinated mm -hmm. at birth, um, routinely. Yeah. routinely. Um, so, so if I could clarify, and sorry if I'm missing something, but it does seem like we're essentially asking employers to ask the, their employees if they've had it and to offer the Hep B vaccine, which might not be possible because it's expensive. It's not like tattoo parlors are going to be able to vaccinate their own staff, but they're basically saying, are you vaccinated? And if not, you know, you can get vaccinated and here's where you can do it. And the practitioner yeah. can say, I'm not going to do it. And then you have it on file that the person is either vaccinated or not vaccinated. So if there becomes a situation where somebody's exposed to, exposed to blood in a you know unsafe way, then you know the status of that person and their vaccine status right right so we're just trying to collect that info and have it on file for safety reasons right right and it seems like that's fairly clear in the way it's worded is there is there any change that we would want to make to that or does that feel like the right stance in this place in this section like does it need to be clarified or is that like it's to me it seems clear but i don't know what others feel <laughs> I know, again, from my point of view, and I, I just echo what Pramila said, it's hard not to hear this as just a very routine um, statement and request. And it although is te technically uh, medical information, do you have the vaccine or not? Um, right. It's a pretty low bar, as far as that goes, in terms of how personal or um, well, Maureen, yeah. uh, sorry, Kiko, is, is it an option for people to be, d does the health department offer the vaccine? Um, you know, we do actually, we can get the vaccine for people who are uninsured or underinsured. We can provide that vaccine. We've actually been talking about doing some clinics for hepatitis because it's a concern in some of the shelters, Hep A right now. Um, so mm -hmm. it is possible that we could offer that service, but only to people who are uninsured or underinsured. Otherwise, they'd need to go to their primary care person. And right. That, but so if they were uninsured, they could. I mean, insurances are required to cover. Yes. I mean, that's a basic vaccine. So, yeah. So they would have an option either way. Yeah. I mean, it's not like we hang out our shingle hep B vaccine no, here today, no, no, but I, yes, we can do it if, if, yeah, it's something, it's one of our services that we provide vaccine for uninsured or underinsured people, including yeah, hep B. I think mostly my question was just to establish that it would be available were all other avenues closed. That's actually true. That is correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, can I clarify something? I just said, Kiko, you said that um, the the employer would be able to, well, the employer would ask their practitioners to 
either tell them that they have a hep B, that they've gotten a hep B vaccination or not. And I, I don't see that in the wording here. It just says. Yeah, I think the wording is um, under 16, uh, I lost it, G. So you're, you're implying information as you're the status of hep B, the hep, B, hep B vaccination status, which means you were vaccinated or not vaccinated. And if you weren't vaccinated that you signed declination notification means you signed something declining the vaccine. So the status is, are you vaccinated? Yes, no. And the declination is, I don't want it signed here. Oh, and that's on page two. That's on page three. Oh, I lost the page. 16? 17. 17. 17. Thank you, Tim. The other thing that's required is um, bloodborne pathogen training, um, which goes right. over all of these, this. You know, it's part that's included in, you know, learning about bloodborne pathogens, what they are, how to avoid them uh, how to avoid needle sticks, but also hepatitis B vaccine is included in in that training. You know the idea that you can be vaccinated for that. So it's it's the information doesn't just come from the employer and saying, oh yeah, I get hepatitis B vaccine. It comes as part of the education around bloodborne pathogens. I think if, we, if that is clear in terms of implementation, I'm fine with that. Okay. All right. Um, and I, again, I think that on page 19, section G, this whole health of the practitioner, um, I think Stephen brought up a question about respiratory infections and a cold, you know, is a cold a respiratory infection? And indeed it is, but I think, I think in some, I don't know, maybe I'm trying not to define things too much, but I think some common sense makes sense in this section, um, you know, if I am a practitioner of any kind that has, or even a person who works in an office with people, if I have a bad cold, it behooves me to stay home and not cough and sneeze and spread everything around. This is a prep a higher level because you know, you're dealing with um, instruments that are being uh, inserted into someone's skin. I'm sure I wouldn't want to have a tattoo or a piercing by somebody who's sneezing all over me. Um, with, you know, if we've learned anything from COVID, you know, it's to respect, <laughs> respect the communicable respiratory diseases. If it's a mild cold and it's not like that, like not so, um, I don't know. So, so I think there's a, a Part, something that says it was likely to, to cause contaminate surfaces. So if somebody has a mild cold and a little sore throat or something like that, I think we you, they probably wouldn't worry about that. So I think just to use common sense and I, for us to try to define that, I think is not gonna be helpful. Um, we all learned to use masks over the last few years. Uh, we all learned a little bit about being cautious about spreading respiratory diseases around. Um, you know, uh, I guess I wouldn't change that. I don't know how other people feel. Did we move on from page 15? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like the last okay. one was 17, and now we, this was page 19, the little, I don't think there's any red uh, text on that because I didn't change anything about, about it. It was in sec, I was just talking about page 19, I think section G, health of the practitioner, something. 
and I thought because could... I had a question about I had a question about regard suspected. We lost the voice, I think. We lost you, Lauren. And she said something about the word suspected. I, I think I don't know where that is. I think it is diagnosed or suspected with that uh, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Um, or hepatitis B. Oh, so that was from a ways back. Lauren, can you hear yes. us? Oh, yeah, I think it's in page 15. Oh. Okay. Page 15. The, uh, the red font diagnosed with or suspected of. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. No. Um, the word suspected, is there a way to change that word? Because it seems like either the um, employer is suspecting and it could be something else you know I, I don't know it just seems we could probably leave that out i would mm -hmm. think that in the past it was harder to diagnose things um both so i think i think we could just make it diagnosed and change that to hiv and good. leave it at that sounds good thanks for bringing that up lauren that's a good point Again, I think those are so was an old must have been an older or statement. All right. So So there is one uh, red font in page 17, uh, section H. Practitioners yes. and apprentices. Right. I just felt that since you're adding apprentices, we should include them in yeah. that statement. I think that makes sense. All right, and then page 19, we got a, I, again, in the area with no red, but the, yeah. um, the discussion about the cold, which I think we can just leave it as is, but Welcome to hear other thoughts. Lauren, could you say what number that is? Because I my pages um, don't have numbers for some reason. Section <clears throat> G, health of the practitioner. I don't know what. I think it's a broader section of standards of practice. Okay. And within that oh, one is okay. section G. Okay. I'll let you try to find it. I'm going to let see if I can actually find my. Okay, I'm. I think I'm back on track with everybody now. I have. I, have, I got Pico's email. Um, so after nineteen, where 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 is our next? The next thing I see is twenty four, about a prior criminal record. That's the next red. Yeah. And I, again, it was, um, this is not having read. I'm going to go back to what I was working off of before. I, I, I guess 
my thought after considering it that is that it doesn't add much and maybe it's you know not ne necessary and the fact that the town the only only uh, license that requires this is the mobile food establishment that's the ice cream truck so you know i think we're in a different category and that we can just even though it, it's not uncommon to see it in the regulations of other towns that it it probably is not necessary yeah and kyle had done some research in which he did call northampton and they said that they recently removed this from their body art regulation so it's no longer in theirs yeah so does anyone disagree with just we didn't have it before uh, that we, we could just leave that out i i agree to remove it okay Does anyone else have it? It's fine with me. Okay. And I guess the next thing that I had that doesn't have any red because I didn't think we needed to change it was the length of the apprenticeship. It, it, it really matches Northampton and other towns and it matches the amount of experience required to get the full license. So. And the fact that as people progress through the apprenticeship, they can start, they're still under the auspices of their trainer, but they can start charging for their work and um, you get that experience under in that setting. So it, it's, it's, it does seem like a long time to me, but it, it just really matches the the amount of experience to get the full license. So they can be pretty autonomous during that time in a number of areas, but they still have the, the trainer. Um, it, so this is in page 28 for those who want to read it. Okay, yeah, I had it at 26, but it, it could be 28 by the time things got changed beforehand. So any other thoughts regarding any of these questions? I think we're at the end of that, except for when it goes into effect. Which you had as March 15th. I did propose that. And um, I guess I want to allow, yeah, I, I guess I did write that is sort of allow three months from the time it gets approved to the time that it, it gets, uh, goes into effect. And so that um, the license department can kind of update their forms and the applications and all the things that they need to do to, to make this, put this into effect. And I didn't have Risha's name on the bottom of the, <laughs> so that is another thing that needs to go on. Um, I think That's it looks good to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a reasonable time frame. I did confirm that that works within our town process that we can change fees, you know, because we need to come up with some fees. I think that right. 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 It's, we'll set. Yes, yeah, so we will set these fees and yeah. we have some new areas to set them in uh, right. for the and um, for the apprentices. Yeah. So yeah, so we that will come back to that, but um 
so at our next meeting, I well, I could we could Kyle and I could get you some background information then about what the current fees are, so that you could figure out how to set the fees for the guest artists who are only working right like, next number of months or something like that, right? Yeah, right. For like well, up to thirty days for each time each term, and then they can have I've forgotten, but three times in the course of the year. Yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, to set that fee and the apprentice and the apprentice fees. Okay. So are we ready to vote on this pending the changes that we discussed? <laughs> All right. Do I have a motion? That's the next step, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I can make a motion to accept the AMOS regulations for body art establishment uh, with the suggested modifications. You have a second. second. Any further discussion? No? Do you want to vote then? Um, Tim? Aye. Lauren? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, Pramila? Aye. <clears throat> Aye. And with that, we've accepted those regulations. I will put the effect. Uh, make the changes we discussed and send them to Kyle. Okay, thank you everyone for this whole process. Um, our, next, our next item is the geothermal well application process. And I wanna thank Tim for putting together a list of um, the types of wells that might be able to be approved by the inspector without coming to the board. Um, I understand. Do you want to discuss that a little bit, Tim, and just explain sure. them? But it makes sense to me. Well, um, so we get like uh, applications at least two or three each time, and uh, some of them are very clear. So I did some research on the Mass DEP website, um, and. And and then some background is provided in that in that document which we have uh, mm -hmm. uh, on geothermal well applications. Um, so I identified six criteria which might allow us to actually allow the inspector to go without public health approvals. So one of them is um, if it's a closed loop system, either horizontal or vertical. That's usually doesn't have any uh, potential hazard of contamination. You know? So, um, so only thing I I um, I read in the Mass DEP website about closed loop system is is the uh, is the construction design. You know, in case there is going to be potential pressure to for leakage or anything, and how uh, that could be minimized, so that the inspector can. Uh, you know, usually reviews the uh, design conditions. The second one is uh, installations which have five or fewer wells. Originally, we were thinking about four, I believe, mm -hmm. but um, mass DEP application had this five uh, wells as some sort of a criteria for their uh, design designation of different types of uh, types of installations. So I I just borrowed it from. Mass DEP underground injection control classification. Mm -hmm. So five or uh, fewer mm -hmm. uh, wells to, that do not exceed seven hundred fifty feet in depth. So that is also another threshold they use uh, in terms of um, uh, less impact versus a much more extensive uh, well installation. So those which are beyond seven hundred fifty um, are usually subject to much more review. So, so here we are saying these are much more shallower, um, 750 feet in depth. 
And then uh, the next three criteria are more related to uh, potential contamination. So geothermal installation that do not discharge or interfere with local water supplies. So uh, if there is a close nearby water drinking water well or any type of water supply, so that has to go through some sort of board of health review. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one is uh, insta installations not within the um, regulatory setback requirements, especially for uh, wetlands and protected areas. So if they if they are not within that particular buffer uh, of regulation, that's our, another uh, criteria where the the inspector can approve. Mm -hmm. And lastly, um, uh, this is a very generic category, giving some sort of a um, uh, some conditions of where the inspector can uh, decide on. So any application for geothermal well installations determined and clearly justified by the health, health inspector to not have health, water supply, and wetland impacts. So um, I'm proposing that the all the six criteria or something, you know, um, the inspector can go ahead and approve them uh, without a board of health approvals. I... I think I understand that. I, I remember looking at the underground injection control classifications and I remember the tech, the terms were like major for the more complicated ones and minor for the right. ones that you're describing here. And it, and I think at one point in time, all of these had to be permitted by the state. And I think they decided these minor ones yeah. didn't know they needed a permit by the state. So the, the last, that general term, is that just to allow the inspectors to say, all these things are true, but I still have concerns about it. I'm going to take it to the Board of Health? Yes. And, okay. and that's, a, that's a, some sort of a um, um, criteria which allows the inspector on the site visit. Everything else is clear, but there is some concern the inspector had. And I mm -hmm. think that's where I think in the uh, the discretion of the inspector they could bring it into the board of health. Right, I think that's a good a good um, extra condition that, that if they feel something's not quite is yeah. even though it meets the criteria, there's still concern it should come to the board. So, what you doing, buddy? So. I I know these are pretty technical things for people who haven't immersed themselves in geothermal wells. Um, I certainly, I tried, but I had to not have the background to look at all of that as, as closely as Tim did. Um, but I, um, I, again, I, I asked Kiko about this. I don't, it, these things don't show up in the regulations. These are for the for the yeah. inspectors develop policies in, right. in their process. So, um, so it is something that we, is it something that we vote on or that we, uh, or just propose to them? I think it's more like a guidance to the health inspector mm -hmm. uh, on making the process much more efficient. Uh, right. So that's why I didn't have in a typical regulatory framework, you know, defining right. and all those things. So right. one, yeah, I, I think uh, we can still vote, you know, because I think uh, this this could be something, you know, which the health ins inspector can take from here on, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I have a few comments. Um, my, my, uh, one of my devices keeps going out, so I had to switch back to my phone. But ever since we've kind of um, had the geothermal start coming up to vote on, I've been a little, well, I've been uncomfortable about voting on it um, because one, most of us don't, like you said, don't know a lot about the geothermal wells. Um, and before this meeting, I did some 
some Googling and um, it is, you know, I know there's the closed loop and there's an open loop and the, the, the open loop, I think draws more water. And so whatever that water source is, it, it is drawing water from somewhere. So I, I feel like conflicted with voting on, you know, wells that are presented to us and we don't really know, like we get a picture and, and you know, everything is, seems okay. But um, I just feel like there has to be more to that process. And I don't know how we find what that process would look like. But also the the geothermal wells take up a lot of space, a lot of dirt space. And um, they say that it helps like reduce, you know, your, um, it, it reduces, you know, the how much you spend on electricity and so forth, but digging up your, your yard, if you, you do have a yard or removing trees does affect the environment as well. And so I just, I, I feel like, yes, there should be another process besides what we're, we're doing now, because um, I remember Tim saying as well that there has been like 16 or 17 geothermal wells that we voted on. But if we're not really aware of the effects of it and kind of, I, I just, I just, I just feel that, that we should look at the process and excluding a vote from the, the Board of Health may not be the best thing, but if we don't really have the expertise and we're just voting, that's not a good thing either. So th those are mm -hmm. some thoughts that I've been having. Uh, just to clarify, uh, if it's going to be an open loop, it will come to the Board of Health. So what we are saying is if, they, if it's a closed loop, um, uh, it is very safe to act for the inspector to decide. Inspector looks at a lot of the design criteria really thoroughly. And so if it, if it has an open loop system, it will, it, it will come to the Board of Health. So we are not excluding it. So these are some sort of exemptions where um, there is least risk in terms of um, any type of contamination. And um, for the second point, which is about potential impacts during the construction, um, that is usually um, um, during the you know the construction plan. Um, there's a lot of uh, um, practices to minimize any type of runoff impacts or anything. So. Um, so that is also a design type of a implementation criteria. So usually the, um, when the health inspector makes a on-site visit, they will review um, any type of a potential impacts. And that's why we have the sixth criteria there to come bring it to the board. You know, if, if they, the inspector suspects there is some sort of a potential impacts on, you know, in terms of uh, in the environment, that's where I think they could bring it to the board. Yeah, I guess, you know, I, I understand that that in the construction they could impact some things, like, but I, I think people experience-wise, we haven't seen people cutting down trees because it, it, it generally these are single bore, it bore wells that are deep and they don't take up a lot of space. You just need to get their equipment into the yard to to do to do it and they i know ed always comments on the access you know is there any problems getting getting the equipment into where they need to go um there are uh, and there are other types of the even closed loop systems that are field uh they're more they do they dig up more space but those are really unusual and it seems like we haven't seen any open bore uh, 
applications at all. I, I think those are also quite an unusual situation where you're able to install that kind of system. So, um, and the other part I was gonna say is in on the board, I've tried to rely on some of the folks on the board who do have expertise like Tim and say, yes, this kind of runoff I'm concerned about or this uh, aquifer is over here. I, I think he, he's my source of comfort in terms of voting on some of these things that are technical in his field. Seems yes, like I hear. Straight, oh. Sorry, mm -hmm. Lauren, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say that <clears throat> it seems like um, what Tim drafted really makes sense to me because essentially we're looking to add Ed's recommendation, right? I mean, that's really how we voted. We voted along the lines. If he says it's okay, then we vote yes. And um, so, in as much as you know, we would expect him to be the source to refer back to us. Th this document makes sense to me, so that we wouldn't have to be looking at, at all of them, at each of them, especially if. You know, and then of course, if there's some issue of concern, we'd have to do a deeper dive into it. But that hasn't occurred so far, at least not since I've been on the board. So, in in cases where it will come to the board or open loop systems, if the wells are more than five, that means there's a lot of wells massive installations, uh, the wells are very deep and some which are going to be interfering with water supplies or impacting protected areas, this is where Lauren's concern is, or wetlands, or those, those which have some sort of a suspected criteria. You know? So the inspector, when they visit, they found probably there is some potential impacts. You know, um, And those are the places or cases it will come to the board. You know, We haven't seen the open loop system in all the cases we reviewed and approved. Everything mm -hmm. was uh, closed loop. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, wasn't the last um, geothermal well application, it said it was close to a conservation or something like that. So what is too close? I just, I, I don't know, I always feel like um, we're kind of voting on something and we're relying on, you know, the expertise of someone else or um, the inspector. And I just, I just know what's best. So the, the town does have regulations for wells, both a water, drinking water wells, but also the geothermal wells are included in those regulations and they state what the setbacks need to be. Um, it's not, an, and those were developed with, with uh, thoughts in mind about what, where water flows and where, where things go. I, I don't know the details of that, but I know, I know we already have a regulation that gets applied by by the inspector, you know, that, that, that there's certain setbacks that are already determined um, in our, our regulations um, for, for, for drinking water wells, but also that geothermal wells are included and they have the same setbacks as the drinking water wells. I have another question for Tim. I know um, some of the geothermal wells are also uh, require a permit by the state, or they did. Are are the ones that fall outside of this group required to have a permit from the state, or is that not the case? Uh, you mean open loop? Yeah. Yes, they need to get, yeah, the mass DEP reviews it uh, in terms of discharges and potential impacts. 
yeah they need to get approval from that in so yeah. the applications the well app or the geothermal well applications classes um open loop is some sort of a has to be reviewed by mass dp and others you know so because potential discharges potential contamination uh, potential uh, uh, potential uh, violation of any setbacks all those things yeah so we kind of have a backup plan for that i guess if you yeah. know if we yeah i think we lost so yeah just as a um, just as a uh, for information we have uh, wetland protection act and river protection act which mm -hmm. is for the whole commonwealth uh, which restricts any type of a uh, installations within 200 feet within the water bodies in you know, a wetlands or rivers like that so so we are primarily uh, uh, much of the installations have to comply with that you know that's a very strict rules you know uh, so here we are talking about those which are outside that uh, outside of those types of regular you know uh, uh, setback um regulations so which are not very close to the river or close to the wetland but mm -hmm. these are residential places you know and mm -hmm. so i think that's why we have i think if you remember um ed when it, when when ed is presenting each one of the cases one of the thing we look for is um the distance to the wetland um mm -hmm. uh, boundary distance to the closest aquifers uh, mm -hmm. if it is overland aquifer that is some sort of a troublesome you know so so those are things which usually ed carefully looks at before presenting to us and so we usually uh, have some sort of a clarif clarifying questions you did you look at this one can you provide us so for some cases he went back and you know brought more information you know uh, mm -hmm. so but these are some sort of very basic uh, information which Ed, you know, particularly recommended, you know, these are very small scale, less impact installations. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question though I have is, while well, my phone is still working, um, <laughs> that it, it depends a lot on who's um, designing the, the well and installing the well. And I, I might not have all the language to like say clearly what I'm trying to say, but um, is there a way to, like I've asked before to have other committees or commissions, um, you know, weigh in on, on it. I know that geothermal wells, they say that it's, it's common, more common now that people you know, are installing them, but I just don't know what the impacts would be and what, who who would look at that if it's not, like who would study this more? And yeah, I just, I just think there's a lot of questions. Lord, I don't know if you were able to hear Tim when I asked if, oh when he talk, spoke about the mass DEP getting involved in wells that are more complex and they've determined that this type wells that fit this, these criteria are considered um, not complex and not so worrisome that they don't need their own permitting through the state. So if there's something that comes up that's more complex, the state review the state DEP reviews the applications and um I you know I think we have one something coming up where the Fort River new school at the Fort River site is going to have hundreds of wells I think not thousands I can't remember but that won't be coming to us as a primary uh per permitter on that kind of thing um so right I I understand that yeah yeah 
I mean, it's, I think it's important to remember that it's a, it's a highly regulated industry. It's not like the wild west where people are just doing whatever they want. I mean, there are rules that have to be followed and the DEP is involved and Ed is very knowledgeable and, you know, all of everything has to be done assorting according to a certain outline that people who are super knowledgeable about these things has, have designed. Right. And so it comes before the board of health for us to be able to say if there's something, maybe something additional or some other health concern that we want to bring up. But mostly if people are following the regulations that are very clearly written, there aren't going to be very complicated things. And if they're extra, extra complicated, it's going to be out of the board of health's purview anyway. I mean, that's what you were just saying, Maureen. So we're like, we're, we're like an additional measure. We're not the be all end all of approving and deciding about geothermal wells. I think if that, if that's a way to summarize it, perhaps. And when I say we, I mean you. <laughs> I'm not on the board of health, I'm just staff. <laughs> but you understand what I mean. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that summarizes well. Um, it's not that we are the only people who are re reviewing it. You know? so it's, it goes through engineering design uh, standards. Uh, it goes through DEP reviews. If, there, if it is a there are in habitat, then it goes through some other DCR reviews, uh, if there mm -hmm. is any fish and wildlife impacts. And so there's right. a lot of potential um, layers of regulation. So we are actually adding to that more on the health side. So we have the authority to actually review it and say no at the end, you know, if there is some sort of potential health impacts. So would the next step then be to share this document? Or did you want to add something to it, Tim, about, um, of course, it's at the discretion of the inspector if there's something, some reason that they need to feel the need to bring it before the Board of Health, that, that's up to them, even if it doesn't meet these criteria. Oh, that's well, the sixth point. Is that the sixth point? Sorry, I missed yeah. it. Ah, yes. Okay, got it. So do we want to vote to support these recommendations to the inspectors or uh, to allow them to develop a policy, their policies in terms of approval of geothermal wells. Um, or do we want to run it by, by the by Ed first and see if he has any thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, it would have been great to have him here this evening, but he's not able to make this meeting often. So I think that would be the, the right thing um, to run this by him. And then, um, and I don't know if we need to bring it back up at another board meeting, because it's not really policy, it's guidance, like you said, Tim. Yeah, um, and so right. unless there's some question or something that doesn't make sense, um, if this looks good to Ed, and we, I had told him what your initial conversations were, and he said that all makes sense to me. So this is just expanding on that. Um, so Kyle and I can definitely share this with Ed and see what the next steps would be from there. If that sounds right. Yeah. Yep. Sounds okay. good. Okay, it does. Um, does it, so it doesn't feel, I guess I wonder if there's a need for us to vote on passing this along to to the health department or or if we just pass it along. <laughs> well, um, if you want to vote, I think it, we'll just vote to accept the determination criteria um, uh, for review by the inspector without board of health approval and um, subject to Ed's review. So maybe we'll vote on that, you know, and- Okay, that sounds, put that into a motion. <laughs> okay, I, 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 make think... a, <laughs> I make a motion that we will um, accept the determination criteria for installation design to be reviewed by the inspector without Board of Health approval, uh, subject to further edits by our recommendations by Ed. I'll second that. Uh, sorry. Is there any discussion? <laughs> yes, I have a discussion. I'm, try, I'm trying to be uh, a full participant this evening. Um, I would like to modify that to 
say instead of um, without the board's approval, without the board's vote. Well, what's the distinction you're making, Lauren? Um, the distinction I'm making is that I still think that the well, whether they're closed loop or open, should come with the board, but I don't think we should have them on them. I couldn't hear the end of that sentence. Oh, I don't think we should have to vote on them. Um, I'm not sure I'm understanding the distinction either. Um, okay. Um, right now, we are presented with Ge geothermal well applications and based on the um, inspectors, his, his approval, we vote on it. I'm saying that this, these guidelines that are saying that we won't have to even see some of the geothermal well applications, we should still see them, but we should not have to vote on them. when they come before us. Uh oh, I have a visitor. <laughs> but if they meet the criteria, why would we not, um, uh, just, why would it have to come? Ooh, oh, hello. <laughs> I'm sorry, okay. guys. What? What a lovely interruption. Yes. <laughs> beauty so i'm just trying to understand why we would need why they would need to come before us if they meet these criteria because i guess that you're saying we shouldn't have to vote on it but why but i'm just wondering what the, what your thinking is in terms of why because one i i think um Water quality is everyone's concern. And like I said, we don't, we should know where the wells are located. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why it's put forward um, on our agendas and put put forth to the to the board. And although um the number of wells i think is going to come in question sooner or later of how many wells maybe too many wells and you know if there is something more that the board would like to suggest for us to be more informed with like maybe uh in-person demonstration or something like that I would welcome that, but I feel like we do need to know where the wells are. I think that's one of the reasons why we're we're informed about the geothermal applications. And um, yeah, like I said, I think that there is going to be a limit, there, or there may be a discussion about the limiting of of wells. Um, so we still have a, a motion on the table and it's been seconded. Um, I guess I'm not wanting to um, push this through, but I feel like there's a, a disagreement among the board members about whether this makes sense, but I feel like we should still bring it to to a vote and and resolve it that way. Um, I don't. I think it might be available to any concerned citizen to find out where the permits are if you are interested in 
if someone is interested in that, they can um, ask for the information from the board, from the health department to know exactly how many and where these are located. But I don't know that it needs to take the time before the board for each one of these to be reviewed if we're not actually in the role of approving them and we've delegated that role to the inspector for certain in these certain settings. So I, I guess I would like to go ahead with the vote. But, um, Tim? I. Lauren? I think we lost Lauren. We lost, I think, yeah. Pamela? Aye. Maureen? Aye. Lauren? Looks like she's coming back. No. Yes, I, no. I'm gonna... Okay, that's, I, got, I, I respect that. Um, so I, I think we, we'll just pass these on to, to Ed. Um, our next area is new business. And this has to do with uh, another tricky question, which is the issue of wood smoke. Um, and I have something here. Okay. I'm going to try to follow. So just the history of this um, is that the board, the health department received a complaint a year ago regarding um, excessive wood smoke in a residential area coming from neighbors in the area. And I think the um, inspector went out, but at the time the inspector went out, things didn't seem to be a problem. So it's really kind of difficult to uh, do anything about that. Uh, the same person brought the issue back to the health department partly in light of the fact that, you know, people's sensitivity about the issue is raised by all of the wood fires in Canada and the, the terrible <clears throat> air pollution that we had during, during the summer months from those various wood fires. I think the problem for the neighborhood is not different. Uh, that has remained the same and may relate to the the type of wood burning device that's being used or perhaps the way in which it's being used, but it seems to this neighbor to be producing excessive smoke. Um, and the questions are what, as a board, and uh, can we do about this kind of a problem? I think, um, I think one of the issues that came up over the summer is just the, the fact that the health impacts of wood smoke is it was recognized more and that it is quite damaging to people's lungs, but not just lungs, it affects people's blood pressure, it affects fetal development, it's 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 a it's a significant uh, air pollution problem for air pollution that produces particles, but also volatile organic compounds and other harmful substances. Um, the town already has uh, requirements for uh, wood wood burning stoves in terms of how long, how much smoke there can be, and for how long. Because I guess most of the smoke comes when you're starting or stopping the fire or adding wood to the fire, or um, and it also has a permitting system that, that people who put it, put in a wood stove or um, have to have a permit to do so and and they actually have there's an educational part to that that you're supposed to um, learn about how to use your wood stove and take this test and pass this test for the for the town to get the permit um, that being said it's still hard to regulate these stoves um, and um, the question is, <laughs> what, what, how, what do we think we can should or could do to help um, with with 
limiting the amount of wood smoke that's in our neighborhoods. Um, and um, are there other ways of looking at this, I guess? Um, you know, I think we might want to ask the inspectors to check this out one, one more time. But the other question is, are, is there a role for monitoring air quality? I know we have one air quality monitor in, in Amherst, this blue purple air monitor that was uh, that we've had for about a year or so, um, but that doesn't really reflect very local uh, uh, issues. Um, I think the and Ed had talked to um, Kiko about this somewhat and thought that a uh, uh, development to try to educate people about how to use their stoves and and um, Kiko and I did talk about it briefly just to, to think about ways sort of brainstorm ways to get information to folks and to try to make sure that they're being used in the best manner possible. I, again, I think it's a tricky question of, how, of what to do um, and what's possible. So any, anybody have thoughts? <laughs> The regulations that we do have from for this, is, there are two separate regulations. One is about the smoke uh, that comes out of the chimney and it's measured in terms of opacity, like 20% or 40% opacity, just how, how dense the smoke is. And I guess um, Susan Malone is a qualified uh, assessor of smoke opacity. It seems like it's a tricky, well, tricky to do. Um, and um, where was I going with that? Um, but we we probably have, it was updated in 2013. That was the most recent update. We probably do have uh, records of permits. Uh, so we do know uh, who might have a wood stove and perhaps could target folks to kind of send them information about better ways in which to use them. Um, so that that was one of the thoughts. I think another thought that I had was whether to uh, try through, um, through the health department and maybe through partners that are have uh, this as their major um, mission is to improve health and improve health and improve the air quality in the in the valley. There is um, the valley is kind of notorious as being uh, having bad air and bad asthma, especially in the southern part of the you know the Holyoke, Chicopee, Springfield area has the highest rates of asthma in the country. Um, and some of that has to do with manufacturing and probably has to do with other allergens, but also wood smoke is a contributor to those, to those conditions. Um, I think we're just putting this out there to think about because we're not gonna resolve anything this evening, but um, I'd appreciate if anyone has any thoughts about ways we might consider proceeding. So I'm just not clear. Uh, um, beyond this 2013 regulation, which actually mm -hmm. says if there is a excessive smoke, which was complain, you know, a complainant brought in, and the inspector goes and measures, and then the board of health. Um, has some sort of a penalties on those violators. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure, you know, what, because it's very clear in this, in this regulation, you know. Yeah. Um, it's very clear. That means on a case by case, the inspector comes and brings to the board and we make a determination on what type of um, changes or penalties that has to be done. So it's already there, all uh, everything in this regulation, you know. So, right. so if the, if that person who's complaining probably has to complain to the health inspector mm -hmm. who goes to the goes to the location and evaluates the stove or whatever the burning equipment evaluates the contaminant plume you know uh, 
um, opacity <clears throat> and then they bring to the board. So again, this regulation is there on the procedures to follow it up, you know. So uh, I, I'm not sure if we need a new regulation or, 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 a, or if we need a new regulation, what type of additions we are going to make to this. I, I, I agree with that. Um, you know, I don't think we have this general problem with wood smoke that, that other communities might have where there's so many people burning smoke and there are a lot of weather conditions where there might be a air inversion where it traps the smoke. And, and in those communities, they have like days where they, like you can't burn. Yeah. So I mean, I don't think we fit that fit that category. I think we have more issues with local smoke. I do think that there is this perception about wood burning that it's like historical. We've done it for, you know, since the beginning, you know, since the dawn of man, you know, and, um, and it's, it's, um, it's thought to be more environmentally safe. It's sort of natural because we're burning wood. And um, and there's also this thought that it, that if you can't see a lot of smoke, you're not harming the air. But in fact, without seeing smoke, it, the air is still being affected by it. But I, I think that there might be a sense, an overall sense that, you know, think twice before burning wood. <laughs> um, it's not healthy for you and your family and your house if you're doing it. Uh, and it, it's not great for the environment, but I don't know that we need, we do have this, this, uh, there is something on our website already about air quality. Yeah. Maybe add something about wood smoke to that as a, as a educational thing. But I, I think, I don't think our regulations are really something that need to be changed. I guess I wondered how well enforced the permitting and the, you know, the, taking the test to make sure people are doing things correctly is happening. Um, it might be nice to confirm that that's all going according to the regulations. Um, but I think it's kind of hard to go, go one day or another day. It depends on the wind, it depends on the wood, it depends on a lot of different things, how much smoke is gonna come out of people to me. And there's different sensitivities to wood smoke. Someone you know, the different people are different. And if whether you have asthma or other kinds of sensitivities, the smoke is probably more bothersome than it is to another person. Um, um, it seems like it's a much, you know, theoretically at least a much bigger issue. But I wonder in this particular case, um, who who is the person who has to respond to this letter that was sent? It, it, does it just automatically go to the inspector and he sets a date and so on, or and then responds, or how does that work? I wonder. Well, let's Kiko for that. Um, when you say letter that was sent, do you mean th this most recent complaint? Yes, that's what oh. I'm referring. To. Yeah, no, it was just a conversation. She didn't send a formal letter. She just reached out saying, I'd like to know, you know, what the town is doing about this issue. And so I spoke to her on the phone. And then I also mentioned it to Ed and Ed said, yes, I remember her. I went out there, you know, so I, I think what I'm learning from this conversation is that the regulations are in place. Like you'd said, Tim and Maureen, they probably don't need to be updated, but, and if Susan is a certified opacity technician or whatever the words are, then if somebody feels like there's too much smoke in the neighborhood, she should be able to um, assess that. But it's all about timing. You know, I mean, if they call her and she's in a restaurant somewhere, she's not going to be able to run over there and check the smoke. And by the time she gets there, it might have changed. So that's where it seems like, if I'm understanding it correctly, the enforcement of it is a little bit tricky um, because it's the wind and everything can change what's happening with the smoke in the blink of an eye. So um, it wasn't to, basically to answer your question, it wasn't a formal complaint. It was more about, hey, can you start a conversation with the people mm -hmm. who make rules, the Board of Health, et cetera, about this issue and whether it should be what we could be doing. Mm -hmm. And I think what I came to is that it's really education that we could be doing more than anything, you know, 
change, put some more stuff on the website, maybe send emails out to people whose contact information we do have because they've gotten a permit since 2013. I mean, that wouldn't be everyone with a wood stove, but it would be some people. It's better mm -hmm. than nothing. You know, that that's doable at least. So um, beyond the education, I, I think all they have to do is just follow the regulations, you know. So the person who is complaining should send a formal letter um, to the board mm -hmm. and we actually designate the inspector to go and do the inspection ah. and it, uh, yeah so we have those regulation procedures you know okay. and if it's not there I think probably Ed probably did this before um, and they do the again you know so it's not phone calls you know it has to be officially mm -hmm. initiated yeah right <laughs> so, right Maybe she sent a formal letter before, and that's what triggered Ed to go right. out and do an inspection. Yeah. Um, but it does seem like inspections are not easy for this kind of thing. I mean, you know, you're it's just so, it can be so transient, right? Or what um, are your thoughts about that? I, I know the, uh, the air quality changes and the emissions, you know, but, but usually I think the inspectors have a way to go more frequently. Uh, or less frequently, depending upon. So they probably will visit a few times to actually get the opacity reading. Got it. Um, so uh, I, I think they all they have to do is just follow this regulation, and uh, if they want to initiate a complaint, let them do it. And so okay. And and from the uh, property where they are, um, the inspector can see if they are downwind, upwind, type of circulation process. Uh, mm -hmm. What type of uh, 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 appliance they have for, for burning, uh, if it meets the standards, all those things are something they could consider. And he, mm -hmm. uh, and the inspector can bring it to the board again. You know, If there was a violation, the board can actually uh, decide on um, any type of a penalties at that stage or even guidance on what type of changes should be made. That's very helpful. I mean, I'm sorry to maybe not make the best use of your time. I wasn't really, I didn't realize that um, there needs to be a formal, I, I didn't read the regulation, <laughs> full, full disclosure. So now I'm learning um, that there is a process to follow. And if this were, you know, I should have basically said to her, if you really need, want to file a complaint, you can do so. And that will trigger an inspection and possibly a board of health review if we do, if there's yeah. a violation. Mm -hmm. So that's a process, let's follow it. So yeah. this has been helpful for me as a new person, just to understand how it works. And also to think about the possibility of some sort of educational campaign, which would be a health department responsibility um, mm -hmm. to do. Yeah. And, you know, maybe we do some seasonal things, you know, we do alerts about tick-borne illness and mosquito-borne illness in the summer. Maybe we should do an alert about wood smoke in the winter, just as a matter mm -hmm. of course, you know, something like that. That is a page on the town website on air quality. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we it could have, have a, a link. lot on it. Yeah. 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 We could have some sort but, of a link from the Board of Health to that site. It, and it then actually, maybe request more information, you know, from those. Uh, there is a big list of uh, monitors. Uh, yeah. That's where we could actually... actually yeah. On the Board of Health website has an air quality one that links to those things. There's another organization in the, that's also on that website. I didn't realize it was, but it is. It's like Healthy Air or something. Air it's, it's based in the Pine. It's based in the Valley, um, and it involves uh, researchers from Yale, and it involves actually other partners and including the Hitchcock Center, and they might be a source for helping with the thoughts mm -hmm. about education. Um, and, and one of my, was one of my thoughts when I, when I saw that. I think partly that the state has mandated improving the air in, in that lower part of the valley because of the significant health effects that have been documented. So it's it's really, you know, a, this is part of a, a more serious uh, health issue. And um, and just to make people aware of that is probably a good thing. Could I ask um, one more question about this, which is, um, you know, you referenced that healthy air network and there are also, I think there's a link on the air quality site to the 
to Purple Air, you know, that place, mm -hmm. that website that does have, but there aren't a lot of sensors in Amherst. I think there's just no. that one. Um, and, uh, you know, in Greenfield, they have a program where they have a whole, they must have gotten a grant. So they have a whole lot of sensors there. And so I think there had been some interest among some constituents, or at least the question, why don't we purchase more sensors for Amherst? So I just wondered, what are your thoughts as a Board of Health about that, whether that's something that we should be doing? Because they do cost, I think they cost three hundred dollars the sensors. At least that's what I had heard. So I'm curious for your thoughts about that. Well, it's not just buying sensors; it's more than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so of course, you know, more sensors, more monitoring, it'll be awesome. Uh, but it's also who is going to collect the data, how they're going to analyze it. How are we going to present it? Who is going to maintain the sensors? So there's there's some sort of a bigger questions on um, monitoring. So I think it'll be so we have air quality monitoring needs, water quality monitoring needs, um, soil quality, and everything. So um, I mean, if it it should be some sort of a part of much larger discussions where we have nice budget to actually monitor our own health and health and environment, you know, so. Um. Well, yeah. I mean, my yeah. understanding was that the the Purple Air program does all the monitoring. You just have to purchase the monitors. And once you put them in place, then all the data is analyzed and oh, okay. up on their website. At least that's what I understood. Um, so it's $300 for-, uh, for That's what I, that, that's my not well-researched information that I have. Yes, I mean, we need to yeah, look at it. <laughs> my not well-researched thing is this healthy air program seemed to show all of these these monitors in Greenfield and in the in Chicopee Springfield, Holyoke, and mm -hmm. one in Amherst, which was at the Hitchcock Center and not the one that's in the downtown Amherst. And I just wondered if mm. linking connecting Amherst to this network might be something to explore. Yeah. Um, Cause that's a, that's a very well, it looks like a, a wealth. Uh, I don't know. It, it, it looks like a, a very um, robust program in terms of the research going on with yeah. those sensors and monitoring. And right. Uh, so that was one, another thought. Yeah, I mean, like you said, make it make use of it. We're not going to start from scratch. We should make use of right. existing things. If it's something we could connect to and it makes sense, maybe. But starting some some whole program of monitoring from scratch is not feasible. Okay. Yeah. All anyway, right. thank you. Thank you for the conversation. I appreciate it. All right. We're going to turn to you now. Sort of the directors. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, um, so I have a couple of things. Um, I did want to let the Board of Health know that we, you know, we have, um, we're part of the Pioneer Valley Tobacco Coalition. And as part of that um, relationship, we do have the ability to, that we are, they conduct um, youth compliance checks um, twice a year among tobacco retailers. And there was a, there were actually two, well, one real violation um, in November, a retailer called Lazy Lungs, um, which was only recently granted a tobacco product sales permit, did sell to a minor. So um, I, you know, this was interesting and new for me to be able to go in and talk to them about this whole process and to tell them that their license would be suspended for seven days and they had to pay a fine. So um, there, that's happened. They've paid their fine and their license will be suspended starting Saturday for seven days. Um, uh, yeah. It was interesting. So that's just, it's, it's important. Like I let the town manager know, he likes to know what's going on with businesses in the community. So that's one thing that happened. The other um, youth compliance check that was done, um, well, they did them at all of our tobacco retailers. And there was one other shop called the Wildside Smoke Shop on College Street that actually does not have a tobacco license. It hasn't had for several years and they sell everything but tobacco, all of the paraphernalia and whatnot. Um, and they have wraps, um, hemp wraps. So they're not blunt wraps because they don't have tobacco in them. They are um, made out of hemp or palm and they're flavored and you could use them to roll cannabis or tobacco. Anyway, they sold one of those products to an underage person, which isn't technically a violation of the regulations because they don't have a tobacco sales permit and it's not a tobacco product. 
but they do think of themselves as an adult only store and they sold a, one of their products to somebody who was not an adult. So I will be following up with them about this, but it won't be. Um, and I spoke with the Pioneer Valley Tobacco Coalition folks about this. It wouldn't entail a suspension of their license, which they don't have or any kind of fine or anything like that. So that's just information I wanted to make sure that the board had. There'll be a sign on the door of Lazy Lungs that says their tobacco sales product sales permit. And I'm being, what I learned is that we have to be so careful with the language because initially I had said tobacco sales license and they said, okay, so we can still sell electronic nicotine delivery systems. No, you can't sell any tobacco or nicotine product. So it's a tobacco product sales permit and it's suspended per the board of health for seven days, starting Saturday mm -hmm. or Sunday. Anyway, so just FYI and let me know if you have any questions about that before I go on. Shall I continue? I don't have any questions. This is sort of exactly the kind of things Rish and I are going to be talking about in terms of the revisions of some of our tobacco sales or tobacco related sales uh, regulations. And we have a plan to kind of start working on that in January. Yeah, it's a really hot topic right now because there are so many new products that are coming on the market and all of these companies are just working around the margins of the current regulations. There's a product, maybe you you mentioned this, Maureen, called Delta 8, which is a curated cannabis product. It's not cannabis, it's not tobacco, but it, so it can be sold by by these stores and it's, um, it's you know, it's very interesting. So, we, I mean, we have to, it's almost like we can't keep our regulations current, fat, keep up because the, the industry is moving so quickly with developing new products all the time. So it's gonna be an interesting project. So thank you to you and Risha for working on that. Um, so I'll move on to the next one. All right, the, yes, okay. Toxic chemicals resources page. Um, so I think, uh, in the last board meeting, I mentioned to you that we would be putting that, that we would make that page live. And I think Kyle emailed you in the meantime, telling you that it's live. So it is live. And we have um, both the document that Tim and Kyle worked on together, plus a whole lot of resources on the toxic chemicals resource page. Um, and then referring people to um, the, the regulation on the website, which governs the use of toxic chemicals by the town. It's very specific, this Board of Health regulation about the town of Amherst avoiding the use of toxic chemicals. So we reference that on the page as well. Um, so that's just wanted to let you know that that's, that's done. We did that and it's, I don't know actually if we're getting hits on it, that might be something that we can look into because I'm always curious to see whether people are accessing the information that we put on our website. So I don't know that, but. That's the update on the toxic chemical topic. I, I had a suggestion. I know yeah. um, it, uh, is it possible to add any graphics or any visual um, pictures? Yeah, so, um, sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, you. that's it, that's it. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say Kyle and I have talked about this. There were plans to redo the website so that it's a little bit more interesting looking, more visually appealing. And when the communications director left some months ago, those plans have been put on hold. So Kyle doesn't, Kyle's the person who updates our website, doesn't really have the ability to do anything more jazzy than what it currently is. But I 100% agree with you, Lauren, that it needs to look better and it would be nice to have more graphics. So we have that as a goal. We just don't have the infrastructure right now. We're waiting for a new communication person to come in so we can start thinking about what our new website design will be like. Okay. So hopefully we can make that happen in the future. Okay, great. Um, so the community health needs assessment update is that you're all familiar with that. Um, the students who produced that did present to the board some, some months ago now. Um, and we were kind of on hold because we didn't have a executive summary for the document. It's a long document and we didn't want to post it without an executive summary. So we completed that. We posted it today. Um, it's on the website, the full community health needs assessment student project, plus the executive summary that we wrote. And I, I actually wrote most of it um, with, with Kyle's help. And it was really helpful for me to go through the 
needs assessment to really understand some of the thing, the findings that were there and to write the executive summary. And I think that's gonna help us um, as a health department, um, especially with me being new, thinking about how we move forward with certain things. So it's been a really good um, sort of guiding document and a jumping off point for some thoughts about more different work that the public health department can do. So you, I think you're familiar with it. It's there for your reference on the website. I'm happy to email it to folks if you want it directly, just let us know, but it is there on the website. Great. Um, and then there was, um, there had been some questions about our ARPA funds and the opioid settlement monies and just to give a brief update on that. So, I, um, I'll start with the opioid settlement funds. So the town just recently um, went to, to um, the financial or to town council to the financial subcommittee to set aside a special revenue fund. So this just happened and within the last month. Um, so the funds from the opioid settlement money are now set aside in a special revenue fund. And that means that it can be spent without appropriation. So there isn't a need to go to town council to ask permission to spend the money in certain ways. So that's the advice that the state has been given to municipalities about how to set up these funds. And they pulled some strings to make that easy. And so we now have that set up in Amherst, which is great. Um, we currently have $162,000 in um, opioid settlement funds in that pot right now. But this is over the course of 18 years, we're going to be getting quite a bit of money. Um, see if I have, did I bring my uh, notes about that? Um, from So th what's interesting about it is that there, there were initially two, um, um, sorry, there were initially two big um, companies that settled. So Janssen or Johnson and Johnson and distributors. And from that pot of money, um, we should be getting over the course of 18 years from those two companies um, over $700,000 over 18 years. So it comes in, in small amounts. And then there are five other companies that also settled. And so there are additional sources of funds that are coming in. All that to say, you know, it's it's not like all that money is in our coffers right now, but over the 18 years, that will be money that will coming to us be coming to us in a steady way. We don't have a lot of sources of revenue for our health department. Um, Lauren had asked this question and I it took me a while, but I did sit down with the um, financial folks to see what our budget is. And our operating budget is only $11,000. So when you take out salary and benefits, what we have left to Whoa. spend on things is $11,000. <laughs> and a big chunk of that goes to the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District being part of that district and thinking mm -hmm. about treatment and whatnot for mosquitoes to manage mosquito-borne illness, which I think is very important. And I'm glad, I know that Jen fought really hard to be part of Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District, and that's good. It's not free, but it is, I think, an important use of our funds. So all that to say, we don't have a lot of disposable income, but this um, source of funding is really, I think we can, I've talked with Paul Bachelman about, you know, using these funds to hire a staff person um, who could really manage some substance use prevention efforts, both upstream and harm reduction efforts, working with youth. Um, it, it's really open in terms of how we spend the funds. It just has to be with an eye towards thinking about those communities most impacted by the opioid epidemic. So it's fun. It's exciting to think about what we can be doing with these funds. We definitely want a lot of community input, and it's actually mandated from the Department of Public Health that we get community input um, on how to spend these monies. But you need someone to manage the program. So I think we're um, on solid ground in terms of being able to spend some of it on a staff person. And it's not a grant that would be over in three years, but continues for some time. So that's also really important when you're looking for funding for staff. If you're dependent on a short-term grant, that's really hard to keep long-term staffing in place. So it's, it's exciting to me because I think we can do some interesting work with young people and some interesting work around substance use that can be supported through these funds. So, that's the opioid yeah. settlement piece. Any questions about that? And this is all just, we're in the planning stages right now, but it's exciting to know that every municipality is getting an infusion of this money. It's terrible the reason, you know, why, but at least there's some compensation for people who have been so deeply affected by the opioid crisis. Um, and then in terms of- um, A quick question. Our, yeah, go ahead. So we are anticipating something around 38K for the town every year. Is that right? 
yeah, you're good. You're good at math. Yes. <laughs> no, no. Right. Just, so even though the money is not here, um, I think that is something proactively. I think your idea about, but um, if we have some sort of a proposal like what you have, have a specialist uh, who can be a staff member working with this particular problem, um, that is something we, you know, we could propose and see if the town can add a, some sort of match that funds. Uh, <laughs> So yeah. we can leverage those money, you know, not just Absolutely. exclusively depend on that. So that's yeah, that's right. Because right, since it's the total is seven hundred and seventy-two thousand over eighteen years from those two companies that I mentioned, so that does sort of it's between thirty-five and forty-eight every year. It's a different amount every year. I don't know how they calculated it, but that's not really enough for a full salary, especially with yeah. benefits. So you're making a good point, but I think when you can, you're in much better on much better, um, you know, solid footing when you have some funds to be able to request additional, you know, cause you have something to leverage, so. Mm -hmm. No, and I guess I, the other thing is, I think there, the, there's opportunities to coordinate with other communities and the, you know, in, in neighboring yes. communities like Northampton and, and Hadley and in this general area, cause there are, uh, there are things happening everywhere uh, yeah. around substance. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that. So, um, Hampshire Hope is the regional opioid task force, and they're coordinating some of these needs assessment efforts, doing a survey and some focus groups with community members, people who use drugs, families of folks who've lost people to the opioid crisis. So there is a lot of regional work happening, and especially for those municipalities that aren't getting as much money, they're thinking about maybe pooling their funds to do something regional um, to, for, to maximize impact. So there's a lot of talk and connection. Right. So that people don't have to uh, create that you know they can share we you know, pool together and, and work together and not have to create create it create everything over again right in each place yeah and we could also partner with umass you know yep um, yes mm -hmm. if they have some good programs you know so that's another way to pull yeah 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 they have a committee <clears throat> that um meets regularly um, to talk about coordinating substance use prevention efforts in the region. So I'm going to be part of that committee. So that will be a good connection also. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That is good. Um, and then in terms of ARPA funds, so, um, you know, we do have some ARPA funds that were designated for the health department. They have, they have provided um, staff support for our staff, including Kyle and Olivia, who've been working on um, our COVID efforts, we've purchased COVID tests and other things with those funds. Um, and I think the big, there's a big chunk of ARPA money. It's about half a million dollars that was set aside for mental health services. And this is something that Jen worked on when she was here. Um, Jen and Earl, the former director of CRESS, um, some kind of mental health services for underserved folks. Um, and that's something that we need to relook at because the original proposal, I think we've maybe moved away from, we don't have a Crest director right now, although we're hoping to be hiring someone within the next month. They're in the process of finding somebody now and I know they have some candidates, so that's exciting. But this would be an important collaboration, I think, between public health and Crest to develop some kind of a mental health intervention, um, especially for those people who are most marginalized, you know, experiencing homelessness and that kind of thing. So all of the ARPA money needs to be encumbered by the end of December, 2024. So we are rapidly working on our plans to be able to make, you know, make sure that we can use these funds because if we don't use them, we have to, we lose them. So everyone's spending a lot of time and energy thinking about that. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I, sorry, I keep in and out, but, um... Of, of the Zoom. Uh, I know I have um, mentioned um, the youth population. So do you, even though you, you mentioned that um, there is no director right now for press, there, it's still operational. So how yeah. would you, um, who would you include in that conversation and how could you include um, the, the youth population in the conversation? And I also, I, I zoomed out after the, the eight years of the opioid settlement. So I don't know if you can go back 
to to that project. Yeah, yeah. I was noticing you weren't there, and I was I was wondering. I was hoping you would come back because I knew you had specifically asked about that. So, um, with the op opioid settlement funds, there's a, a sort of steady infusion of money over the next eighteen years, and there's a lot of interest in doing. Um, work with young people um, around substance use prevention in the schools. Um, I think mental health is obviously a driver of substance use among young people. So there's a connection to be made there. Um, you know, it's not like we're getting hundreds of thousands of dollars a year with the opioid settlement money, but it is a steady infusion that can support some programming. So I think it's it can serve as a basis for doing some work with young people. And then for the mental health work collaboration with CRESS, I think it's great to think about how that we've set aside that money to work on mental health issues. I think we need to rethink how to do it. And I think involving youth voice would be important. So, um, and I'm just getting to know the Crest team. Um, I think they have a lot of interest in doing that. Um, I think there's definitely potential for that type of work to be expanded to young people. So I'm going to be doing a lot of planning with the staff, the public health staff over the next um, month or so with a little bit quiet over the holidays. It's a good time to think about things. So we'll be fleshing out some of these plans in the next month. I lost you guys for a few minutes there. But <laughs> we lost you. You're back. <laughs> Glad to see that you're back. Um, so those are most of my updates. Um, there, there was one thing that I'd forgotten to put on the list, and I don't know if this is of interest to you, but Susan Malone did say that sometimes she people have questions about new restaurants or, um, you know, restaurants that are opening, restaurants that are closing. So I have a whole long list of restaurants that have opened and restaurants that are closing. And I don't know if you want me to tell, go through those with you or send them to you in an email, or I'm not sure what your interest might be in hearing about that. Um, or if people have questions about a specific institution that they heard was closing or, some new restaurant that you're wondering about? Um, I guess, are they closing for <laughs> for health reasons or uh, no? Um, no, <laughs> just um, a lot of places have transferred ownership like Casa Grande Pizza on Fearing Street is now called the Campus Pizza. So it's a different owner. Mm -hmm. um, and um, other places have just gone out of business as far as I understand it, but nobody closed for you know mm -hmm. violations. That you would know about. <laughs> right. I guess we would. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't mind hearing um, the new restaurants. Okay. I'll just give you a quick summary. So um, in 2023, the inspectors licensed, thir licensed 32 establishments that provide food services um, and an additional 105 licenses for brick and mortar establish establishments that are restaurants, groceries, and convenience stores. So I guess the first one was food services in colleges, schools, fraternities, and 105 other ones. So anyway, a lot of licenses in that year. Um, of the 105 licenses for brick and mortar establishments that are restaurants, grocery and convenience stores, 10 were newly opened. Um, and they are Amherst Burger Company, Campus Pizza, which used to be Casa Grande Pizza, Carefree Cakery up in North, the North Mills District, Cupcake Place. It's great, I've been there. Um, DP Doe, Futura Coffee, Lao Hu Tong on Main Street, Papa John's, um, Royal Chicken Kebab, Taqueria del Pueblo and the White Lion Brewery are new ones that opened in 2023. And then closed, I mentioned Casa Grande Pizza, which is now Campus Pizza, Cisco Cafe, um, Hazel's Blue Lagoon, Keeney's Nutrition, Kelly's Diner, which I guess was an institution, has closed, and then Rice Alicious are the places that I know of. <sighs> Amherst Burger Company also shut down. I just wanted to include that. Well, yeah, um, that's what I had been told. But then Susan emailed me earlier this week saying they haven't closed. So I'm not Again, really sure what's going on there. <laughs> no. Are they currently closed, Kyle? I saw like it was boarded up today and then past oh. week or so. I heard that they changed ownership. So maybe it's something not that so maybe they didn't deem it as closing down or something yeah that might be it it might be coming back it's, i read something in the gazette oh okay uh, 
All right. I know. I know we already moved on off of the um the um the funds, um, but I I have to keep reiterating that because of um the other committees like the CSSJC and um, as you mentioned the Crest Department, they um keep speaking about how how they're going to be funded and how they're gonna collaborate. So is there a way that as the public health department starts its conversations, is there a way to have um, more input, like, like to know and, and to kind of steer um, those conversations so that, um, and that, that planning so that, you know, all those um, committees are involved. Cause I, I just feel like, um, there's been a, a lot of delay and um, we kind of wait for the, we kind of wait for the response or wait for something to happen. And we really don't know if it's targeting the areas where, where community members may see the most need. And so I just wanted to know if, if those conversations and that planning would be open Um, yeah, I think those those commissions and committees have some really important findings. Um, we are we have we're sort of collating all of the um, results of all of that work and other assessments that would be relevant to what's happening in Amherst to put against our community health needs assessment so we can use all those things when we're planning what to be doing. Um, and I plan to work really closely with Cress. I think that they're a great, um, you know, partner for us in public health. Um, so all of the, the commissions that have done all that work, I don't, I think it's really important. It's there for a reason. Let's make sure that we consult that and use that when we're planning any, any interventions that we're doing in public health. So okay. thanks for reminding me about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think those are all of my updates. Thank you. Can I have oh, a, can, That's can really I ask a quick, yeah, go ahead. quick question? So I know we have a summary of the community health needs assessment yeah. on the website, and we have a set of recommendations at the end. You know, I'm just curious how those recommendations are being communicated to the relevant departments. You know, so <laughs> I think it would be helpful to maybe share our summary with those. For example, uh, one recommendation is for school programming. And um, yeah. I, I mean, I'm just looking at the next step, you know, on uh, on how to implement those recommendations. So, if there is any specific way we are actually engaging those specific uh, departments in those in implementing those uh, recommendations. So, we have, I think, the colleges and universities connections in terms of student housing. So, uh, trying to yeah, like some sort of communicate this to those, you know. I'm just curious about what is the next step on that. Yeah, well, um, it's a great question. And I think that, um, you know, since I'm new in my job and I hadn't really had a chance to go through that whole needs assessment until just now. So writing the executive summary was really helpful for me to get in, to see all those recommendations. And I think they're the last paragraph in the assessment and in the executive summary about how this is not just the responsibility of public health and the board of health, it has to be a collaborative thing. So this is sort of a roadmap for me. I think there are a lot of next steps that me and Kyle and Olivia need to start thinking about how we can implement those recommendations with the partnership of other entities in the town, because it's certainly not something that we can do on our own. So we're just beginning to think about how to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to, I, I, I do want to say something um, that I think is important, even though Risha is not here. I did um, remember that she does some kind of like strategic marketing, um, I think it's her background, mm -hmm. and um, it would just, it just would be helpful for me um, and any other board members that have um, experience with like um, outreach 
to be able to be part of, um, if not like the conversation, um, just just to 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 continue bridging those you know those um, the partnerships as you as you say um, yeah. and um, I went to a um, community discussion um, in Springfield with Beat the Odds. Um, it's uh, through the Springfield. Uh, it's it's through the Springfield Youth. Um, I'm sorry, there's too many <laughs> too many organizations, but it's the Public Health Institute of Western Mass, and they partnered to um, put together this uh, uh, space for young people, and it's called Beat the Odds, mm. um, and they have like these these cute little um, merch, like swag merchandise. They have journals, they have hats, um, but most importantly, they have a space for young people to go to and to like just be there and, and also to learn, um, you know, different things about health and about their community and so forth. Yeah. So I just, I would um, like to see some that really targets youth and I know I just I just I just yeah I just would like to continue to be part of the conversation it would just be helpful to know what what the the Department of Health what they're doing and how they're going to share that with you know yeah yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm definitely looking at what other communities are doing in thinking about this. So I appreciate that resource. Um, but that's it for me. Any other questions that people have for Kiko? Uh, okay, I think we're ready for a, a motion to adjourn the meeting. I can make a motion to adjourn the today's meeting. And a second? I'll second. OK. <laughs> um, with that, the meeting is concluded. And we will see everyone on January 11th, 2024 at 530. Thank okay. you, everyone. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Bye. holidays. Happy New Year. Yeah. Bye-bye now. Bye. -bye. Bye.